Being a step parent is very difficult and comes with a unique set of challenges. Most of the time, the child can form a good bond with their step parent, but as I'm sure we are all aware, it doesn't always work out this way. And in extreme circumstances, the relationship can turn abusive. Sugar warning, we will be talking about sexual abuse in this episode as we uncover the unsolved disappearance of Mary Duncan. Hello and welcome to the 27th episode of Uncover True Crime Podcast. My name is Stephanie and each week we uncover a different unsolved true crime case ranging from missing persons, unsolved murders, Jane and John Doe's and suspicious deaths. You can listen to the podcast on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast streaming apps as well as on YouTube by searching Uncover True Crime. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Uncover underscore pod and on Instagram at Uncover True Crime Pod. I recently featured in an episode of the Files Obscura podcast, which went live this past Tuesday. We discussed the lead masks case which took place in Brazil. It is a fascinating case and we had a lot of interesting discussions, so please go check that out. That episode will be available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify and wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Before we start today's episode, I just want to let you all know that we hit 10,000 downloads last week and I want to thank everybody who has ever listened to the podcast. Whether this is the first episode you've ever listened to or if you've listened since the beginning, thank you so much for tuning in and caring about these cases as much as I do. But without any further ado, let's uncover the unsolved disappearance of Mary Duncan. Alexandria is a small town in Scotland with a population of just over 5,000 people as of 2018. The River Leven runs right through Alexandria and leads to one of Scotland's main tourist attractions, Loch Lomond. This is where Mary Bell was born on the 19th of January 1959. She had two brothers, Ricky and Jimmy, and three sisters, Marion, Debbie and Mandy, and was raised by a single mother called Ruby. Ruby and her six children lived in a two-bedroom home, a tough situation for any family. At some point during the 1960s, Ruby married a man called Norman Duncan and she and her children adopted his last name. At first, Ruby thought their lives would improve now that she wasn't parenting her children alone, as being a single parent in the 1960s was very difficult. Mary's sister Mandy said, quote, It was 40 years ago. She was a single parent with six kids. We lived in a two-bedroom tenement building with no indoor bath. Someone prepared to take her and her six kids on must have seemed like a godsend." Sadly, this couldn't be further from the truth as Norman went on to sexually abuse Debbie, Mandy and Mary, a horrible secret that wouldn't be discovered until decades later. I don't believe Mary ever told anyone about the abuse and she was said to be, quote, quiet but happy, unquote. Her sister Debbie described her as saying, quote, she was quiet, she loved sewing and she'd make clothes for her and Laura. She was petite and loved the Osmonds. We weren't just family, we were pals, unquote. Laura was Mary's daughter who was born on the 15th of February 1975 when Mary was 16 years old. I was unable to find out how she explained the pregnancy to her family, but we will talk about Laura's paternity later in the episode. Mary loved her daughter with all her heart, but tragically, her time with Laura and the rest of her family ended abruptly in March 1976 when Mary left her home and never returned. Mary was 17 when she went missing on the 19th of March 1976, just after Laura's first birthday. It is believed that earlier that day, Mary had a doctor's appointment where she found out she was pregnant for the second time, although this has never been confirmed. A few sources have mentioned this and I was unsure where this information came from. I am not doubting its validity as it is possible Mary confided in someone about this before she went missing and her doctor wouldn't be able to tell police due to doctor-patient confidentiality. However, later that day in the early evening, Mary left her home on 3rd Avenue and said she was going to visit a friend, but she never returned home. It's been reported that Norman was seen near Mary's friend's house that night, but I don't know if this was 
photos a confirmed sighting of him or just someone that matched his description. The friend's house was on Tully Chewin Road in the nearby town of Balak, which was only a 30 minute walk from Mary's house. I couldn't find any information confirming whether she made it to her friend's house, and if she did, there is no information as to what time she left. Mary was last seen wearing a mid-length navy skirt, black platform shoes, a green hooded zipped top, and a black and white dog tooth check coat. There is not a lot of information available about the original investigation into her disappearance, but her family have always insisted she would never run away as it was not in her nature to run off and she certainly wouldn't have abandoned her daughter. In the 1990s, Debbie found the courage and strength to report the abuse she had suffered at the hands of Norman Duncan to the police because she believed it might lead to answers as to what happened to Mary, but due to lack of evidence, no further action was taken. Debbie's courage to speak out about her abuse inspired her sister Mandy to do the same, and she told her sisters that Norman had abused her as well. It wasn't until police decided to take a closer look into Mary's case in 2016 that they found DNA that had been taken from Laura the day she was born. I believe this DNA might have come from a prick test, which was performed on all newborn babies in the UK to test for genetic diseases such as cystic fibrosis. They tested the DNA against Norman Duncan and it proved that he was Laura's biological father. This evidence was enough for police to charge him with seven counts of historical sexual abuse. He was found guilty of six of these charges and sentenced to only five years in prison, although I believe the short sentence was probably due to the fact he was 70 years old when convicted. In 2019, police investigating the case confirmed that they were conducting searches in relation to Mary's disappearance. One of the articles discussing this said that police had excavated a piece of land, and another showed a photo of police searching the home of Norman Duncan. I don't know if these were two separate searches or if the excavation took place on Norman's property, however if they found any evidence they have not made it public. Police also reveal that they have spoken to Norman Duncan in relation to Mary's disappearance but have not officially named him as a person of interest or suspect and have not divulged what if any information he told them. While I remain hopeful that police will or have found evidence in their searches, it is hard to ignore that the small town where Mary went missing from is on the shore of Loch Lomond. Loch Lomond is a very large lake that has an overall surface area of 27.5 square miles and is around 190 metres deep. While I don't live in this part of Scotland, I have visited the area where Mary went missing and from what I was able to gather, it is a very quiet town for most of the year, but is very popular with tourists who want to visit the nearby national park and the loch itself. Loch Lomond is beautiful, however it would be a very easy place to dispose of a body. As I said, it's important to stay hopeful, but as I'm aware most of my listeners aren't actually from Scotland, I thought I would share some of my personal knowledge on this area, as I think there's a huge possibility her body was disposed of in Loch Lomond, although this is all speculation. Police are now appealing for any new information relating to Mary's disappearance. Mary has never paid tax or national insurance and she didn't have any money on her when she left the house, so it's very unlikely that she ran away. The police are particularly interested in speaking to anyone who knew Mary or her family around the time she disappeared, or anyone that worked at the Vale of Leaven Hospital in 1976, as they have evidence that has pointed them towards this area of town. Vale of Leaven Hospital is only a 30 minute walk from Mary's house and she was known to frequent that area. DCI Graham Cordner has admitted there are certain challenges in the case as it happened over four decades ago but stressed that it is never too late to come forward. Quote, My concern is someone would have information and is thinking they can't turn it into the police because they should have done this 40 years ago. What I would say to anyone in that position is not to worry about that. We are not going to judge anyone who comes forward with information at this stage as to why they didn't tell us in 1976. The important 
important thing is that they do come forward because without that information it's going to be difficult to take it further forward and get answers for the family, unquote. Mary's sisters also spoke at the press conference and Debbie said, quote, over the years we've come to realise she is no longer alive but this investigation gaining momentum has given us hope that we might get some kind of resolution. Cases go cold and there's not much you can do about it but since the middle of last year things have been moving forward and I have more confidence that it is being investigated thoroughly, unquote. Even in her absence, Mary's played a huge role in a serial rapist being imprisoned for his awful crimes, and it's amazing that police were able to use the DNA from Laura's prick test to convict him. I have never heard of DNA from a prick test being used this way, and while I know it might be a controversial way of obtaining blood samples, in this case, it was the only option police had. Just seven months after Mary was last seen, her daughter Laura died of bronchial pneumonia when she was just two years old. Ruby Duncan, who was with her granddaughter in her final moments, has suffered more than anyone in this world should have to suffer. This family has been ripped apart by one cruel man, and while nothing can fully repair the damage he has done, all Mary's sisters want is to bring her home. They celebrated what would have been Mary's 60th birthday in January 2019 and her sister Marion spoke about the new investigation into Mary's disappearance, saying quote, It would be wonderful for us to get her back, especially at this time. We should be having a birthday party, buying balloons and celebrating Mary's 60th birthday with her and her children and maybe grandchildren. That's a whole generation missing from our family. Our grandkids are growing up and every time we have a birthday or anniversary, we are reminded Mary's not here and her kids and grandkids are not here." Unquote. Mandy added to this, saying, quote, We just want to finish it and bring her home so our family can be complete again. Unquote. Mary was 17 years old when she was last seen on the 19th of March 1976 in Alexandria, Scotland. She was wearing a green hooded zipped top, a mid-length navy skirt, black platform shoes and a black and white dog tooth check coat. If alive today, she would be 61 years old. If you have any information on Mary Duncan's disappearance, please call Police Scotland on 101 or Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 one. All pictures and sources related to today's case can be found on our website at www.uncovertruecrimepodcast.co.uk. If you like the podcast, please rate it on whatever podcast streaming app you listen to it on. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at uncover underscore pod and on Instagram at uncover true crime pod. That's everything I have for you today. Thank you for listening till the very end. Please stay safe and have a good night.